Ben. Um, the North Dakota Policy Council, if you're not familiar with us, is we're an organization dedicated to promoting sound public policy that's based on the classical liberal idea of free markets and uh, civil liberties, property rights, liberty government, constitution. And we devote all of our, um, a, well, a lot of our time to promoting those policies and those ideas at the state legislature um, with civics groups and um, uh, you know, a, any other political, politically oriented group uh, that we can and, and teach them about why, why we think uh, free markets work and the government should be limited. But the other part of what we do is kind of what we're doing tonight and that's the whole events like these with with uh, prestigious uh, authors and, and people who are well known within our movement for advocating um, uh, the economic principles that, that we all share. And really, I, I, I can't think of, of anyone be better than um, uh, tonight's guest to talk about these things because uh, when, when we step back and take a bit and look at, at the big picture, when we look at history and economics, and where we've been as a country and as a people, we, we need to understand those things before we can fix the problems that we have today, whether they're societal problems or problems with our government. And Tom DiLorenzo has, from what I can tell, reading his many books and articles and watching YouTubes and all of those things, has, um, in my opinion, done just a fabulous job of uh, intertwining economics with history and showing that indeed it was capitalism that got the United States out of very tough times. And contrary to what we're taught in public schools and kind of what the media tells us and, and what uh, the conventional wisdom is, it wasn't, you know, for instance, FDR that got us out of the Great Depression. Um, it wasn't... Uh, Herbert Hoover's great laissez-faire policies that are bad laissez-faire policies that got us into the Great Depression. No, when you look at the historical facts, it's very evident that free markets work, limited government works, and whenever it's been tried, wherever it's been tried, it has worked. And to getting back to what how the role we play in all this, the policy council. Because we like to host events like these around the state. Um, we uh, this this fall we had the opportunity to, to host our uh, annual dinner, our free market forum with with Congressman Ron Paul. And uh, so you've got to get a flavor for the type of people that, that we invite to these things. And these people are, that we invite are different than the typical politician is. And I'm not even saying that Tom is a politician because he's not. But a lot of groups, a lot of politically minded groups, um, invite uh, these politicians to come in and tell you everything you want to hear and promise you the world and say that if you just elect me, you know, by God, we're going to turn things around. And as an organization, we, it's kind of our philosophy to cut through all that. And let's get down to actual economics, let's get down to actual history. And that's why, again, we invite people from the Mises Institute, if you guys are familiar with, with that organization, to come and give these kind of lectures. Um, before I, I, I introduce Mr. DiLorenzo, um, Sean is going to be walking around and passing out some of those those, uh, those two buttons that I had uh, talked about before. And he's also going to pass out, I think, a flyer about uh, a couple of some events that we have. But, um, I don't want to take up too much time tonight because uh, we've, we've got such a, uh, such a great guest. Thomas DiLorenzo is the author of How Capitalism Saves America, which happens to be the United States. A professor of economics at Loyola College in Maryland and a senior fellow at the Ludwig von Mises Institute, he has written for the Wall Street Journal and the U.S. Day Today and Washington Post and all these other uh, big mainstream uh, media outlets, but I, I've got to say that the, probably the, the publications that he has uh, produced um, uh, that I've liked the most are his challenge and his, uh, I call it, I, I hate to say contrarian view of Lincoln, because it's the actual 
uh, historical fact. It's the record on Wayne Baker. But uh, uh, Tom has made a, a, a career, I suppose, on um, exposing um, someone who's known, especially to the Republican Party, as the great emancipator. And uh, so I've, I've really enjoyed um, reading, you know, understanding exactly uh, um, how, how Abraham Lincoln actually was, uh, what the policies he pursued, the things that he said, as opposed to the, uh, the things that we hear in, at, at public schools. Uh, but without any further ado, I would like to welcome uh, Mr. Thomas D. me and uh, thank you all for coming and uh, maybe I'll explain a little context about why I, uh, an economist like me would write a book on Dean Lincoln and I've written several books uh, and that uh, now Lincoln I call him the political son of Alexander Hamilton and uh, I've written, written one book called Hamilton's uh, Curse or rather Hamilton, yeah, Hamilton's Curse uh, it's a, a critique of another book called Hamilton's Blessing and at the time of the founding of America, uh, many of you are probably uh, familiar with his famous debates between uh, Alexander Hamilton and uh, Thomas Jefferson. And part of the debate was over whether or not uh, the government should use tax dollars to give to corporations to build roads and canals. And believe it or not, that was the economic policy debate in the whole ninth, first half of the 19th century. And, uh, and so I wrote a book about uh, Hamilton who I sort of portrayed as the bad guy in the argument because he wanted uh, Did you raise the a lot of them? Yeah, I can't hear you. Yeah. Uh, I hope it's turned on. Okay, I'll, I'll pretend I'm on uh, karaoke night. Yeah. Protectionist tariffs, a huge public debt, corporate welfare, as we call it today, and a national bank uh, modeled after the Bank of England. He's a uh, uh, Fed, uh, has a publication. Uh, it calls Hamilton the founding father of central banking in America. And uh, Thomas Jefferson opposed him every, uh, every step of the way. Uh, Jefferson was a free trader. He opposed uh, uh, the idea of a bank run by politicians out of the nation's capital. Well, who came up with that idea anyway? Let's start a bank and put politicians in charge of it. And uh, of course, we have that today. It's called the Fed. But, uh, but Hamil Hamilton succeeded in getting the first Fed. It was called Bank of the United States. So I wrote a whole book about that. And then uh, also, this other, my other book that uh, Brett alluded to is called The Real Lincoln. Uh, it's, it just carries forward in American history the same, uh, same argument that, that went on for decades over this. Because I was a Civil War buff for, um, for a number of years. I read all these books about the Civil War. And, I, and of course, being an economist, I thought, well, uh, what could I say that, uh, or write about this? Um, you know, economics to the Civil War hobby of mine. And, uh, and I discovered that Abe Lincoln spent 25 years in politics before he became president, involved in nothing but the economic agenda of Alexander Hamilton. He was a Whig. And then the Whigs picked up the old agenda of the Hamiltonians in the 1830s, 1840s. And so my book on Lincoln, uh, one of the distinguishing things about it, as opposed to all the other ones, is I explain how it was that uh, um, that this argument over statism versus laissez-faire was finally ended during the Civil War. You know, even, even if you ignore the whole business of slavery and all that, there, there, were, there were monumental economic policy changes on the domestic side of policy that happened. Uh, to nationalize the money supply with the uh, legal tender acts and the National Currency Acts. We had 50% tariffs that lasted until 1913 when the income tax came in. And we began the process of massive corporate welfare, uh, beginning with the railroads. And, then, and that created, of course, the biggest scandal in American history, a uh, political scandal from that point, during the Grant administration was over the, the uh, it was called the Credit Mobilier uh, scandal. The French, uh, they even created a phony baloney company with a French name, although no one would discover it, I guess. <laughs> it gave it a French name. But, uh, and so that if you're wondering why an economist is writing about Lincoln and all these things, it's sort of a part of my uh, economic history research that traces this the great debate between uh, are we to have a status interventionist economic policy or more laissez-faire? And really a big breaking point was the Civil War. And my Hamilton book actually came out after the Lincoln book. So I sort of did this backwards historically. 
And, uh, but when I wrote it, uh, my publisher at Random House <coughs> did such a good job with the uh, press release when the book came out that uh, I got an uh, MSNBC um, uh, send a limo to my house at 6 o'clock in the morning to immediately put me on the uh, Morning Joe television program because the press release was so persuasive that this book about Alexander Hamilton, of all things, explains the crash of 2007. Uh, and the bailouts, uh, and the role of the Fed, and so forth. You know, you know, it, was, uh, it was Hamilton's curse, and so uh, and so it didn't go. It didn't turn out too well when I was on uh, MSNBC. Though they sat me down next to Patrick Buchanan, and the first thing he said is, "Alexander Hamilton is my hero." <laughs> so, so they brought me in to talk about my book, and, uh, and so they let me talk for about ten seconds, and then uh, about five of them just totally uh, you know, shouted me down. <laughs> and so I just sat there and let him go, uh, and, but I did get the last word in. Uh, I did the last word in, I said the very last thing before they went to a commercial break, and I said, at least Aaron Burr had a good reason for shooting someone, unlike Dick Cheney. <laughs> 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 so I went them laugh, laugh, laugh about here, whatever you want to talk about. And it was a good lesson in how uh, these, the, uh, these television, the big shot of television networks, they're there to support the establishment in Washington. And they get somebody like me or, or heaven forbid, Ron Paul to challenge the establishment, they, they, they censor you, they try to drown you out. That's why they hate the internet so much. Uh, that's why they constantly hear about proposals to put a kill switch on the internet. They, they don't like that. Uh, and so anyway, that, that's just a little context of what the, uh, why uh, why it is that I've written books on the weekend and Alexander Hamilton and, uh, and my, my latest my next book is coming out this year uh, has a very tame title uh, <coughs> Organized Crime The Unvarnished Truth About Government that's, uh, that's the next one but, but I thought what I'd do tonight is uh, since Brett asked me to talk about uh, my book How Capitalism Saved America uh, I'll talk about I want to talk about a, a part of one chapter of that that involves North Dakota in, um, in, in a kind of a big way, actually. And uh, the genesis of this book, my book, How Capitalism Saved America, which I think we still have a few copies for sale on front, was uh, I published by editor at Random House after I wrote the Lincoln book. Uh, there was the Enron scandal. I don't know if some of you remember the Enron accounting scandal, and some people committed suicide over it, some people went to jail. And, uh, and, uh, and uh, he called me and said, you know, there's going to be the usual uh, spate of books by Michael Moore and people like that saying that all business is like this, all capitalism is crooked and corrupt and, and thievery. And so he said, why don't you use your, uh, you know, your thing? And I, I was known at that time for uh, using history to explain economic phenomena for general audience. And, that's what and he proposed, well, write a book as uh, a defense of capitalism based on historical stories. Uh, and this is what I did. So this was an attempt to be sort of an antidote to uh, that sort of thing. Uh, but of course, after uh, the crash, the real estate crash uh, of, of 07, the exact same thing happened. That uh, right away, you have all these people saying that the cause of the crash, what's that? Oh, they are? I think they just have bad hearing back there. Right? <laughs> <laughs> well, I keep those to the bottom. <laughs> but, uh, but anyway, the, the short of as soon as the real estate crash happened, the economy crashed, the same cast of characters immediately swung into action, blaming it all on the free market. And of course, the, 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 the main reason of the crash was the, the Greenspan Fed and its, its low interest pol rate policy that created the housing bubble. On my office door, I have, a, I have a New York Times article by Paul Krugman from 2001 giving advice to Alan Greenspan, in which he says, Alan Greenspan needs to create a housing bubble to make up for the stock market bubble, which has just burst. And of course, Alan Greenspan did take Paul Krugman's advice and created a housing bubble. And not only that, but some of you might be aware of the fact that uh, beginning in the mid-90s, with the Clinton administration, uh, they, they really uh, revved up this policy that the government had had since the 70s of forcing mortgage lenders to make bad loans to unqualified borrowers, so-called sub subprime borrowers. My next-door neighbor is a, a run, owns a mortgage company, and just talking to him on a golf course five or six years ago, he started telling me about no dog loans. And I've bought and sold houses several times, and I thought, you know, what on earth is a no dog loan? I always had to 
uh, give everything but uh, an x-ray of my intestines to the workers to play the next time I walk the house. Uh, no, it was so uh, if you really have really, really bad credit and not enough income to pay the loan off, then don't worry, go on. You didn't have to show a W-2 card. That was government policy uh, in, in the beginning of 1995. And so, you know, is it any wonder there was a subprime crash? And so this was all interventionism that caused this crash. The Fed caused the bubble. And then this policy of forcing mortgage lenders to make bad loans to unqualified borrowers. Uh, for example, the, the, the Fed gave countrywide countrywide uh, uh, bank a special award for having made $600 billion of these bad loans. And then a couple of months later, countrywide went bankrupt. Uh, to give you some idea of how much money was involved here, these bad, they're called toxic assets now. And so this was caused by interventionism through and through. But listen, to some of the things that were said about it, um, here's the New York Times. The mortgage crisis is laissez-faire gone wrong. Uh, America's laissez-faire ideology as practiced during the subprime crisis was as simplistic as it was dangerous. Uh, uh, another one, uh, Hank Paulson brings laissez-faire approach to the financial crisis. And uh, another article in the New York Times said, uh, over war in the days of laissez-faire. They thought this was going to kill the laissez-faire. It was meaning no government regulation at all. Uh, so, they, so, they, so all the, the prestigious uh, uh, left-wing newspapers and talking heads all said the same thing. And that's what happens every time. Every time a state creates an economic crisis, they always blame it on, uh, on anybody else. Politicians are the most irresponsible people on earth, after all. And, uh, there are only a few exceptions, but they always blame everybody. And of course, uh, business people are, are great, uh, great scapegoats. And so, um, so this has happened again. And so the story I want to tell, though, is how you know, one way to fight this is education. And people have to understand that there is a difference between free market economics and, or laissez-faire economy and what you might call crony capitalism. What usually happens is we have these problems that are often are created by crony capitalism. That is, a system of a, where there's a cozy relationship between businesses and government and government uses that, the business use that, that relationship to finance the political careers of their benefactors who then bail them out when they're in trouble. Uh, you know, you think people will learn that lesson when the first thing the Bush administration did, which was carried forward by the Obama administration, is to make sure their buddies at Goldman Sachs got billions of tax dollars for the dumb, uh, dumb business decisions they had made previously. Uh, that really spoke volumes, didn't it? on who, who government policy is really for with regard to the Fed. Uh, they even bailed out foreign bankers. I mean, not even just the American bad bankers, but the foreign bad bankers got bailouts for the Fed. Which, uh, if it wasn't for Ron Paul, we would never know about this. And they finally got the Fed to do a partial audit from all of the uh, political pressure was still on it. So people need to understand there's a difference between these two things, because it's easy for the enemies of economic freedom to look at these corrupt deals, which this was uh, a corrupt deal, the bailouts, uh, and blame it on capitalism, and then make the case for even more control, more central planning of capitalism. Uh, the Fed caused the crisis, and then, of course, the first thing Bernanke did after the Fed caused the crisis and the bubble burst was to say, well, the free market led to too much systemic risk, so we need a new government agency, perhaps under the wing of the Fed, to regulate systemic risk and make sure it doesn't happen again. Um, you know, that's, that's like putting arsonists in control of, uh, of fighting house fires, uh, putting the Fed in control of regulating financial risk. And so, but that's, that's what uh, happened. So anyway, the story I'm going to tell you is about, uh, it's an example of the type of writing I've done trying to get this point through uh, in, in my own way. And the story involves the, um, one of the first uh, big, large-scale efforts of government to subsidize corporations. It happened be be beginning uh, in, the, in the Civil War. And uh, in June of 1861, the beginning of the American Civil War, uh, Abe Lincoln called a special session of Congress to do what? To get the ball rolling on subsidizing the building of a railroad from Iowa to California. That was the top priority. The war was on. Uh, there was a big uh, Confederate army a couple of miles from Washington, D.C., calls Congress back 
to get legislation going to start building the railroads in California. Uh, that, tell, that tells you a lot about what the priorities were in, in, uh, in the Republican Party in those days. And of course they did, they, they, and, and they started the, uh, uh, that, that, uh, the building of the transcontinental railroads uh, in a subsidized way. And the reason that happened right then in that period of history was that when the southern states seceded, uh, the southern Democrats had always been the primary opponents in this thing. The, sort of the political heirs of Jefferson had always been the, the main opponents in Congress. But they, they were no longer there, they're gone. And so the Republican Party took advantage of this and did what they had been trying to do for 70 years, you know, long before there even was a Republican Party. And so they got this going. And so by the time you get into the post-war era, you have um, you know, the, the, the big uh, government subsidized transcontinental railroads. But you did have uh, one counter example. And many arguments were made that uh, no one could ever build a railroad unless they had massive amounts of government money. And, and of course, that was why they had to be massive amounts of government money. There was one counter example, though. Some of you uh, being from North Dakota may have heard of James J. Hill. I, I'd be curious, uh, how many people, if any, have ever heard of James J. Hill? There's like, quite a few in, in here. And, uh, they built the builder of the Great Northern Railroad. Well, I distinguish my writing between a genuine market entrepreneur, who J was James J. Hill was, and a political entrepreneur. A political entrepreneur in business is someone who works the political system to either get subsidies of some sort for himself or to get laws and regulations passed that, that harm his competitors or both. Uh, a market entrepreneur makes money by producing excellent goods and services at low prices for his customers. That's what a market entrepreneur does. And so, so to understand the difference uh, between these two, it's, 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 it's really one of the best stories there is comparing Hill to, uh, to the people who built the, uh, the, the subsidized railroads. The, the chief engineer of the government subsidized railroads, by the way, was a man named Grenville Dodge. And as soon as the Civil War was over, he proposed to Congress that they make slaves out of the Plains Indians and make the Indians uh, dig the railroad beds to California. But uh, Congress decided, no, we're not going to do that. We're not going to make slaves out of the Indians and use uh, Union Army veterans as the overseers uh, of this new slave system. So they decided to try to kill as many Indians as possible on uh, the Plains Indians. And there was a sort of 25-year uh, war of genocide against the Plains Indians. And, and, and uh, Sherman himself, General Sherman, was in charge of this war. And he said in his memoirs, the main purpose of the war against the Plains Indians was to make way for the railroads. So the, 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 the waging of war against the Plains Indians was really a, a form of a veiled subsidy to the already government subsidized transcontinental railroads. Uh, James J. Hill built a privately funded railroad and investors funded. He accepted no land grants. He paid for rights of way for Indian land with livestock or, or money or whatever they would want to trade for. And he didn't have the ability to call in General Sherman's army to murder all the Indians. Uh, that was that was the government subsidized railroads had the ability to do that, and and, and of course they, they did, they did, and so um, here's what Hill himself said. He bragged uh, in his autobiography. He said he built the, the Great Northern without any government aid, even the right of way through hundreds of miles of public lands being paid for in cash. So he paid cash for the lands. He and his investors, and I even uh, no one can see this. I didn't know if it was overhead here or whatever. But I printed out from the internet. Maybe the guys at the front table can see it. This is the uh, the uh, the rail line, the Great Northern Rail Line, that goes right through Minnesota and North Dakota. Uh, it was the northern route to the Pacific Ocean, and, uh, and it's on the web. If you if you go on, go online and just Google James J. Hill and the Great Northern, you'll find this route. It goes right through uh, you know close to Bismarck. If you look at this uh, this map here that I have, and so uh, I guess that's why some of the people in the room have heard of Hill. And uh, you know, Hill was a guy, a very interesting guy. His, uh, his father died when he was 14. Uh, he dropped out of school to work at a grocery store for $4 a month to help support his mother and his siblings. And he worked in uh, farming, shipping, steamship, fur trading, and railroad industries. So he learned business. And, and he, became, he became one of the all-time great American business uh, entrepreneurs. Uh, even uh, Ayn, Rand's, uh, well, Ayn Rand's famous novel, Atlas Shrugged, uh, one of the characters is modeled after James J. Hill. Um, but she thought so much of him. And I have, I have a good quote of how what the people of Minnesota and the Dakotas thought of one of James J. Hill's competitors, Jay Cook. Uh, 
Jay Cook was a political entrepreneur, and uh, Jay Cook was a defense contractor during the Civil War, and, and helped and he, he, he helped finance the, 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 the Civil War also. And as a payback, as a political payback, he was uh, allowed to become the owner of uh, uh, the Northern Pacific, the, the, the competing railroad, government subsidized railroad. And uh, a, a historian said this about what, what the people of Minnesota and the Dakotas thought of Jay Cook. As he said, quote, they considered Cook and his business associates to be derelicts at best and thieves at worst. <laughs> so they didn't have very, very, very good opinion of, of these people uh, uh, that were building these government subsidized railroads. And, uh, and so when, when James J. Hill started building his, uh, if you read the, the history of the Great Northern, they, 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 they laid rails twice as fast as the government subsidized railroads were. Uh, James J. Hill made, uh, understood that if the people in the Great Plains uh, did not uh, really flourish financially, neither did he. And so he, he, he sometimes gave away, gave cattle to some of the, the, the people out, uh, on the, along the route. He subsidized the towns. He brought the uh, biggest agricultural experts of the day uh, for them to benefit from their knowledge. Because he understood that if, if these towns didn't prosper, neither was he and his railroad. And so uh, the government subsidized railroads were very different. And he also built uh, the, the uh, most direct route to the, to the uh, coast also. He hired a, an engineer who discovered the Marias Pass, which was uh, a pass through the Rocky Mountains that had been discovered by Lewis and Clark in 1803. And no one had ever found it since then, but James J. Hill found it and it knocked 100 miles off of his route. Uh, he used the best timber they could find, uh, uh, and they built, they built the railroad twice as fast, and he ended up building the most efficient railroad by far. And he reveled in price cutting. The, other, the government subsidized railroads were constantly trying to fix prices and gouge their consumers, and they were constantly engaged in price-fixing conspiracies. But James J. Hill reveled in undercutting them all. They would all get together in a smoke-filled room and decide to uh, you know, increase their prices by 50%, let's say, and then Hill would come along and decrease his. And, and that would, of course, ruin the whole price fixing conspiracy. And, uh, and, and so you can understand why uh, the competitors, government subsidized competitors, did not like Hill very much. Uh, and they eventually got their revenge against Hill uh, by the 1890s. They had the federal government pass two, two federal laws that outlawed price cutting uh, on the railroad, in the railroad business. And, even, and, and of course, it was Hill who was the preeminent price cutter of the day. He was just a smart businessman. He, he gave his big customers, like John D. Rockefeller, the biggest discounts, I mean, volume discounts. And the rest of them were unwilling or unable to do that. And so they had a law passed that outlawed discounts. He said it was discriminatory. And you can't have discrimination, can we? You can't, you can't have price discrimination. And so, and so if you look at his route, uh, which I held here, it's, pretty, it's a pretty direct route, pretty straight line from, from the Midwest to the northern United States to uh, to um, uh, the West Coast, but the government subsidized railroads were very different because they had to rely on uh, congressional votes to keep the subsidies going. They were paid per mile subsidies, okay, paid per mile subsidies. Think of the incentive that creates. The government's going to pay you a subsidy for every mile of track that you lay. And so they would, they would uh, build, you know, a winding, circuitous routes. Uh, that, you know, that there was, and if I had the map of these railroads, it would look like a cobweb up here and also every every politician in in the west said you only have my vote if you run a separate line to my town and so the separate line to my town might have been totally uneconomical no no good business person would ever run a line there because it's not a business but they had to do it if they wanted the subsidy and so they did and that made it inherently uneconomical they even built uh, the Greenville dodge even built uh, tracks on top of uh, 10 feet of ice pack at the, at the beginning of winter. And then when the, when the ice melted, the track would collapse. But, but that was good, it was a good thing because he would get paid twice. He would get paid again for rebuilding the track. And so that's, that's how, it, how it worked. Here's, here's what one historian who wrote about the, uh, the government subsidized railroads and said. He said, since the dog was in a hurry, he laid track on the ice and snow. Imagine that. How many of you would, would uh, be concerned about riding a train and you do the tracks were on top of ice that could melt you know, on a warm day? 
So naturally, the line had to be rebuilt in the spring. What was worse, the unanticipated spring flooding along the lower fork of the Platte River washed out rails, bridges, and telephone poles, doing at least $50,000 damage the first year. No wonder some observers estimated the actual building cost at almost three times what it should have been. And so the amount of waste was astonishing. One, uh, uh, and one, one uh, historian pointed out that uh, you know, James J. Hill is out there hiring the, the best engineers in the country to find the most direct route, whereas the government just blasted its way to the, to the West Coast. They use, on an average day's work, they use more gunpowder blasting their way through the Rockies than was used in the whole Battle of Gettysburg in the Civil War. If anybody ever saw that movie, Gettysburg, that Ted Turner made, there's a famous uh, scene of the famous artillery battle uh, that went on. It was probably the biggest uh, artillery barrage in world history up to that point, you know, preceding Pickett's charge. And, and so, uh, and so just imagine a normal day's work, you know, just kind of using more more gunpowder than that, trying to blow your way through the through Rocky Mountain. Sounds like something the government would do, doesn't it? Uh, and of course, it's enormously costly, but who cares? Uh, it's, it's, it's not your money. Okay, so of course that, that's that's what happened. Um, here's an example, you know, compared to the, the super efficiency of James J. Hill. Here's here's a description from another historian of uh, of what the government subsidized railroads did to make profits. Uh, one of the one of the uh, top executives was Thomas Durant. Uh, this historian says, in 1866, Thomas Durand wined and dined prominent citizens, including senators and ambassador and government bureaucrats, along the completed <coughs> section of the railroad. He hired an orchestra, a caterer, six cooks, a magician, uh, and then this historian puts in parentheses, uh, to pull subsidies out of a hat, question mark, and a photographer. For those with ecumenical pat palettes, he served Chinese duck and Roman goose, the more adventurous were offered roast ox and antelope. All could be expensive, were offered expensive wine and for dessert, strawberries, peaches, and cherries. It's kind of like the dinner we just had here. Uh, after dinner, some of the men hunted buffalo from their train coaches. Durant hoped that all would go back to Washington, inclined to repay the UP, the Union Pacific, for its hospitality. So that's what a political entrepreneur did in those days, as opposed to Hill, who was, Hill would even, would even uh, take the place of some of his workers. He would actually show up on the job and spell some of the workers uh, if they looked like they were dragging it and needed, and needed, uh, uh, and needed help. Uh, and so uh, later on in his career, Hill, Hill got into the steamship business uh, and, uh, and because his railroad was up, went all the way to the West Coast and so he did that. He also talked uh, Frederick Weyerhaeuser into the idea of shipping uh, lumber from the Northwest to the Midwest, the Midwest on his, on Hill's Railroad. So he became a business partner with uh, Weyerhaeuser, uh, the, the, the timber company. And, uh, but eventually the government caught up with, uh, with Hill. And the Interstate Commerce Act of 1887 and then the Hepburn Act of 1906, where Hill was still in business, uh, made it illegal to charge different rates to different customers uh, in the railroad business. And so if you had, you know, volume discounts were outlawed. And so the, 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 the railroads that were unwilling or unable to uh, offer discounts, uh, unwilling primarily, uh, they got the government to say, you know, rather than uh, uh, them cutting their prices, and they said, well, nobody can cut their price. Everybody has to pay the high price. No volume discounts to anybody. And so that was patently uh, anti-competitive. And it was aimed at Hill. And then later on, you know, the, Sh the Sherman Antitrust Act was the first antitrust law, anti-monopoly law, at the federal level. It was passed in 1890. The first, uh, the first big federal antitrust suit was against James J. Hill. And, and of course, he was in no way a, a, a monopolist. There were hundreds of railroads competing in America, in, in, the, in the West, uh, especially at that time. And so, and so this, this is an example that I want to offer you of the type of uh, type of research and writing that I've done to, to illustrate what I think is a very important point that people need to understand uh, about the difference between a market entrepreneur and a political entrepreneur, because the, the market entrepreneurs really uh, did save America from, from a lot of uh, the debacles and disasters. Uh, another chapter in my book that uh, Brett mentioned was, I have a chapter on Herbert Hoover, who was a progressive and a big interventionist. 
And I quote, I quote uh, FDR's top economic advisor, a man named Rexford Tubwell from Columbia <coughs> University, as saying that uh, everything they did during the New Deal was just an extension of what Hoover, Hoover started. But uh, if you read the high school history books, most of them will tell you, tell you that, uh, that uh, Hoover was an advocate of laissez-faire, and that's what caused the Great Depression. Uh, untrue. Uh, you know, all you have to do is read any biography of Herbert Hoover to find out what he did policy-wise. They're in the they're in the books, in the history books. But uh, the public schools usually lie about that. And also, one of the things that economists like me know, but the general public hasn't caught on to yet too much, is that uh, FDR actually made the Great Depression worse and longer lasting. He didn't get America out of the, out of the Great Depression. And one of my chapters, I quote Newt Gingrich as saying. FDR was one of the greatest statesmen in American history. He got us out of the Great Depression. So even, even someone like Duke Gingrich believes uh, believe that nonsense. Uh, although he's a historian, uh, a lot of economists, so I guess I can excuse him for, for that. He was, he was talking about the same uneducated historian as all the rest of them talked by I suppose. That must be the Republican Central Committee telling you that it's time to go. Buggies is bugging the room. Uh, <laughs> Gingrich can't pay it, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> Ask him how that new quality is coming in. Why? <laughs> so, so uh, and so this this is an important point. Uh, I try, I've written several books about it, as I said, in my book on capitalism. Uh, uh, it's one of it's one of a few awards. I won a couple of book of the year awards by academic free market academics uh, on it. And it didn't get me on television like the Hamilton book did, but uh, but I'm still trying. And I think there's probably room for another one like this. And to give you one idea of how acidized this this way of thinking is uh, with the current economic dilemma we've been in for years, uh, a standard line of argument has been Alan Greenspan knew Ayn Rand 50 years ago. Alan Greenspan was chairman of the Fed in the early 2000s. Therefore. Ayn Rand's laissez-faire ideas caused a crisis uh, of 2000s. If there, if Paul Krugman has said that, and the New York Times, and all these people who have these, these high positions, that's the logic that they use without even looking at what uh, someone like Alan Greenspan actually did. And so, uh, so the enemies of economic freedom, as I call it, uh, are not ashamed to lie. Uh, they prove it year in and year out. And so what, a lot of what I'm involved in is uh, is sort of uh, trying to throw a fire extinguisher on all these lies uh, that, that, uh, that are put out there about markets. And, uh, and, uh, and the biggest one is that piece of crony capitalism of the sort where the Bush family bails out their buddies uh, in Goldman Sachs is capitalism. Uh, do you remember, by the way, that Bush's Treasury Secretary, Paulson, left Goldman Sachs, went into government, arranged a $3 billion bailout for Goldman Sachs, then went back to Goldman Sachs, and got a huge bonus. Uh, does it get more corrupt than that? I mean, and, uh, and of course, uh, Obama will do the same thing, Clinton did the same thing. That's, that's not capitalism, but the same people, though, the same people will blame, you know, once this is smoked out and the public hears about it, they'll blame it on the markets. And, and, that's, uh, and so if you, want to, if you want to see markets and economic freedom destroyed, do nothing about this, let them have their way. But uh, those of us uh, who have been associated with the BC Institute that Red mentioned, and I've known Ron Paul for uh, forever, for 30 years, something like that. Uh, and no one is uh, a tougher fighter on these issues than, uh, than Ron Paul is. And, uh, but uh, I can't make any predictions about what's going to happen with, uh, uh, with the only keep up the fight, I guess. And I guess that's all I'm going to say for now. I'll try to take uh, questions or comments.